All right, so you've just earned your college degree and you're ready to start your first professional position. Awesome. Or maybe you've started a business and you're starting to market your products and services to customers, clients, stakeholders, investors, folks like that. Or maybe you're an actor and you've just landed your first gig. This is exciting, right? You're jazzed, you're pumped, you're ready to prove yourself. Still, you can't help but feel like maybe you're a fraud. And in truth, you have no business being there. Well, if this sounds familiar to you, you've got imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? The term imposter syndrome was coined by clinical psychologists Drs. Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. It refers to a collection of intense feelings that can be best summed up as intellectual phoniness. It's the feeling that you're a fraud and have no business doing whatever it is that you're doing. According to Jill Corkendale, executive coach and writer with the Harvard Business Review, imposters suffer from chronic self-doubt and a sense of intellectual fraudulence that override any feelings of success or external proof of their competence. They seem unable to internalize their accomplishments, however successful they may be in their field. This means that no matter how successful somebody may be, they fail to feel any sense of satisfaction in their accomplishments. This is particularly interesting when we consider the fact that imposter syndrome seems to affect high-achieving, highly successful people. I mean, we're talking actors, business people, performers. It's a who's who of celebrities when we look at those who struggle with imposter syndrome. What does imposter syndrome look like? So what does imposter syndrome look like in practice when we're actually exhibiting it? Well, it really falls down into three main categories. Feeling like you're a fake. First, it's the feeling that you don't deserve your success and that somehow or another you've managed to deceive others into thinking that you're something that, quite frankly, you're not. This being the case, you suspect that it's only a matter of time before you're found out and unmasked for the fraud that you are. Discounting success. Second, you have difficulty accepting compliments, choosing instead to downplay your accomplishments as no big deal. By minimizing your skills and hard work, you undervalue your contributions. But why do we do this? Well, remember, you think it's just a matter of time before you're discovered. So by discounting your contributions, you make sure others don't look too closely at the value you provide in your organization. Attributing your success to luck. Third, in addition to discounting your successes, you reject them altogether. Instead, attributing them to luck or some other external factor rather than your own skill and hard work. This separates your talents and work from the success, making you basically a non-entity in the results. Why do we experience imposter syndrome? Okay, so this is how we sort of exhibit imposter syndrome. But the question now is why? Why do we feel this way? Why do we experience this? Well, there's a whole lot going on here, much more than we can cover in one video. But here are a few key factors to consider. Venturing into the unknown. First, as we discussed earlier, those that experience imposter syndrome tend to be high achievers. We're talking goal setters who like to stretch themselves further than they have before. Thing is, this means leaning into the unknown, into foreign territory, which in turn means that to a certain degree anyway, we don't know what we're doing, not fully anyway. As a result, when we're successful, we feel guilty that we've somehow pulled the wool over the world's eyes, that we're not worthy of the success that we've achieved. Not fitting in. Second, imposter syndrome is linked to a sense of feeling like an outsider in whatever arena we're playing, and that somehow we managed to slip in when no one was watching the door. 
We look around the room and imagine that everyone else is so much more accomplished and experienced and educated and basically worthy to be there than we are. Fear of failing to live up to expectations. Third, the more we succeed, the more others expect us to be successful, to continue being as brilliant as they perceive us to be. Problem is, we don't think we were all that brilliant in the first place, and now they want us to do it again? Surely this time they're going to see through the lie. What can we do about imposter syndrome? Now, if you're watching this video, odds are you've already done some research on imposter syndrome, and in so doing, you've no doubt come across some tips and tricks that you can use to kind of keep these feelings at bay, right? These tips and tricks include things like listing your past accomplishments or reminding yourself of praise and recognition you've received in the past and allowing yourself to feel a sense of satisfaction in what you've done rather than a sense of self-loathing at what you did not do compared to what you wanted to accomplish. Now, these are all solid. They're absolutely solid, and I invite you to explore these. However, what I would like to do today is kind of give you my own formula for beating imposter syndrome. Now, to be clear, it's a little weird, all right? I, I'm just going to come out and say it. But it has worked for me, and I would love to share it. Nevertheless, to each their own, right? Okay, so with that, let's get started. Lon's weird-ass approach to beating imposter syndrome. Now, one thing to understand about my particular approach to imposter syndrome is that it's not just one idea or principle. It's rather an amalgamation of many philosophies and ideas that I've come across that on their own may not seem to have anything to do with imposter syndrome, but when put together, the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. So, Bear that in mind as I start to sort of feed up the various individual ideas. So with that, let's get started. Reject reality. The first thing I want to do is call into question reality itself. After all, the very nature of imposterism requires that we accept a construct as real. You see, you can't be an imposter pretending to be something you're not, if there is not a construct that defines what that something is in the first place. I know, I know, it's, it's confusing. Let me show you what I mean. In the movie The Matrix by the Wachowskis, the protagonist Neo could see the Matrix for what it was, an artificial construct created to keep the human race asleep to the truth that they were slaves to the system. This idea has been kicking around for quite some time, a favorite among philosophers. Rene Descartes pointed out that, because our senses sometimes deceive us, I wish to suppose that nothing is just as they cause us to imagine it to be. And because there are men who deceive themselves in their reasoning and fall into paralogisms, even concerning the simplest matters of geometry, and judging that I was as subject to error as any other, I reject it as false any reasons formally accepted by me as demonstrations. As the British philosopher Alan Watts says, most civilized people are out of touch with reality because they confuse the world as it is with the world as they think about it and talk about it and describe it. For on one hand, there is the real world, and on the other hand, a whole system of symbols about that world which we have in our minds. He goes on to describe the world as a marvelous system of wiggles, in which we describe things and events in the way as we would project images on a Rorschach blot, or pick out particular groups of stars in the sky and constellations as if they were separate groups of stars. Well, they're groups of stars in the mind's eye, in our system of concepts. They are not out there as constellations already grouped in the sky. These ideas suggest that everything we perceive and describe as reality is a construct of the human mind. Even Thor in the movie Avengers Infinity War knew this when he pointed out that all words are made up. Indeed, everything about how we participate in society is made up. 
Think that Valentine's Day is a made-up holiday? Well, I've got news for you. They're all made up. So, turning back to Neo for a moment, his power was that he had the ability to change whatever he wanted, to make the Matrix as he saw fit. Well, if the philosophers are right and everything is made up, you know, a construct of our minds and society, what's to stop us from being our own Neo and remaking the Matrix as we see fit? In the words of Adam Savage, quoting the movie The Dungeon Master, I reject your reality and substitute my own. Reject convention and make your own rules. The next thing I want to do is invite you to make your own rules. After all, there are any number of people out there who are more than happy to set the rules and to tell you what it takes to be a this, that, or another, whatever it is you're trying to be. But as the saying goes, who died and made them king? You have just as much right to set the rules as anyone else does. Let me show you what I mean. In her book, Rebel Talent, Harvard Business School professor Francesca Genot explains that rebels are those who, instead of clinging to what is safe and familiar, following the social routines of tradition, defy the status quo and march to their own drummer. By challenging assumptions and turning convention on its head, these rebels become the master of reinvention. And what are they reinventing? The rules. For example, Janot says, whenever we face an important decision, we naturally ask ourselves, what should I do? But this framing constricts the answers we will come up with. When we instead ask ourselves, what could I do? We broaden our perspective. Now think about it. By framing the question around the word should, we acknowledge that there are rules of what we should and should not do. Now, in most cases, should denotes obligation, duty, or correctness, all things rooted in rules. On the other hand, by asking what we could do, we reject the notion that there is a larger governing authority that sets the parameters around what we should do. In an example of this idea, Genot tells the story of Ava DuVernay, director of the movie Selma. As a woman in her 30s, DuVernay found herself spending a lot of time and energy trying to get in with the right people, have coffee with the right people, make connections with the right people, all things she had been told she should do. Then one day something occurred to her. I started thinking, they're just regular people like me with ideas. I've got ideas. It was at that point that she began to ask herself what she could do and rejected the traditional industry conventions. Reject the critics. Finally, just as I invited you to reject reality, I invite you to reject the critics and their unworthy criticism. In his poem, The Man in the Arena, President Theodore Roosevelt points out that it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. It is hard to imagine a more damning rebuke of imposter syndrome than this. Building off of Roosevelt's poem, researcher and author Brene Brown talks about the box seats in the arena. The box seats are occupied by those who erected the systems, institutions, establishments, you know, the construct set in place to justify their power. These are all embodiments of Neo's matrix, systems and constructs erected to establish and maintain an authority in a given domain. Connie Chatterley, protagonist in D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover, had her own view of the box seats, the seats which she herself occupied. Referring to the plight of her husband's coal miners, Connie lamented that their lives are industrialized and hopeless, and so are ours. 
Now, it's not hard to imagine how the life of a coal miner in the early 20th century could be considered industrialized and hopeless. What's remarkable, though, is the last clause, and so are ours. It suggests that a gilded cage is still just a cage, and that their circumstances, while infinitely better than those of the workers, are nevertheless tied to an immutable system. In the eyes of Connie, those in the box seats are prisoners of the very apparatus they created to elevate themselves above others. With this in mind, we can see that criticism from this population is at least somewhat tainted by a self-serving and desperate narcissism. Now, in addition to the box seats, Brene Brown also talks about the cheap seats in Roosevelt's arena. These are full of people whose only contributions are criticism, cynicism, and fear-mongering. Brene Brown has no use for these plebeians. As she puts it, if you're not in the arena getting your ass kicked on occasion, I'm not interested in or open to your feedback. In so stating, Brown strips those in the cheap seats of any power they feel they may have to call into question her performance or her contributions. Putting it all together. Okay, now that we've gone over all the individual ideas, let's put them together and see how we can apply them to battling and overcoming imposter syndrome. Now, for this example, let's pretend that we are an artist of some sort. We're talking a writer, an actor, a filmmaker, a painter, a sculptor, it doesn't matter. Somebody who creates something for the world to see. Okay, so with that person in mind, let's remind ourselves of what's going through their head. I'm a fake. I'm a poser. I have no right being here. And sooner or later, somebody's going to discover me for the fraud I am and shame me out of the industry. What do you mean you're a fake? I mean, what constitutes art in the first place? Have you created something remembering that art is in the eye of the beholder? Then you're an artist. After all, if not you, who else gets to decide what is art and what isn't? Is it those in Brene Brown's box seats, those who built and controlled the machinery? Screw that. Just because your art isn't hanging in a gallery or being shown at Sundance doesn't mean you're not an artist. Besides, as Connie Chatterley would point out, those in the box seats are prisoners of the very apparatus they've built in the first place. They'll do whatever it takes to safeguard the systems, institutions, and conventions that they've erected and legitimize their authority over us. Instead of letting them tell you what you should and should not do, follow the example of Janelle rebel and ask yourself what you could do. As Duverney says, everyone's just a person doing a thing. You can do a thing as well. And well, that makes you a doer of things. But what about the cheap seats? Surely it's the market, you know, the almighty dollar and the accolades of fans that decides whether you're an artist or not. Really? You're going to put your sense of self-worth in the hands of that fickle, uncoot rabble? And tell me how somebody who has never created a single thing and put it out there for the world to criticize has the right to pass judgment on whether or not you're an artist. Those people have never once set foot in Theodore Roosevelt's arena and dared greatly, so their opinions should count for naught. Besides, the question of who should stand in judgment of your status as an artist is moot. As Thor would point out, artist is a made-up word. Why not be like Neo and remake reality as you see fit? Remember what Alan Watts said, that we confuse the world as it is with the world as we think about it and talk about it and describe it. So, rather than accepting the constructs of reality that constrain us, embrace Rene Descartes and reject as false the reasons formally accepted, or as Adam Savage might say, reject the reality of those who are unworthy, those who are not in Roosevelt's arena daring greatly, and substitute your own. And there you go. I told you it was a little out there, but it works for me. At least, I try to make it work for me. I have to admit, I have to remind myself of this stuff quite often. And so, in fact, if anyone's watching this video, it's probably me. But if you have found anything in here helpful or thought-provoking or insightful, please integrate them into your own strategy for overcoming imposter syndrome. After all, 
You have some great work inside of you. Don't let anyone squash it. You need to let it come out and shine. All right, so that's it, everyone. Embrace it, go forward, and do something awesome. And until we talk again, have a fantastic day.